Are logic and faith compatible? Can you be a Christian and still be logical? Logic, Reason, and Christianity this week on Creation Magazine Live. Welcome to Creation Magazine Live. My name is Richard Fangrad. And I'm Calvin Smith. Now, despite what some people believe, logic and reason are essential to Christianity. Without them, it's impossible to deduce anything from the true propositions of the 66 books of Scripture, which is the final authority for the Christian. Right, and this also applies to creation. Uh, one of the of foundational doctrines of Christianity, and in the next half hour, we're going to touch on examples of valid and fallacious reasoning showing how logical reasoning can support uh, the truth of biblical creation and demonstrate the fallacies in many of the evolutionary arguments. Now, to begin, we need to explain the basics. Logic is the science of the relations between propositions or statements. Logic can tell us what can be inferred from a given proposition, but it can't tell us whether a given proposition is true in the first place. Right. Now, an axiom is a self-evident truth. Right? right. It, it, it's a proposition or a starting assumption that is assumed to be true uh, without proof. And all philosophical systems, including atheistic beliefs, rely on logical deductions from starting assumptions, axioms, which right. by definition can't be proven from prior assumptions. You've got to have a starting place somewhere. Right. Yeah. So the next question is, given our axioms, is it rational to accept the propositions, the statements, made by the infallible God in the 66 books of the Bible? Is it a logical and reasonable, reasonable conclusion to believe the Bible? Right. The now, question. something else that needs to be clarified is the difference um, uh, between the magisterial or the ministerial use of reason. Right. right? So the, the magisterial use of reason occurs when reason stands over Scripture like a, like a magistrate and, and judges it, right? right. Uh, such reasoning is bound to be flawed because it starts with axioms invented by fallible humans and isn't revealed by the infallible God. Right, and that's the chief characteristic, of course, of liberal Christianity, so-called Christianity. Right. And, it, it, and it's, uh, it, it's refuted by scriptural passages such as in Isaiah, uh, it says this, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are, are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Now, note, it doesn't say that my logic is higher than your logic. The logic has to be the same. Right. Otherwise, you could have a situation where if we believe that 2 plus 2 equals 4, God could believe 2 plus 2 equals 5. Right? And the, you'd the, never know anything. It, right. Revelation would collapse. <laughs> yeah. What it does mean is that God knows every true proposition. God knows all truth while we know only a part. That's what that means. Right. Now, the ministerial use of reason submits to Scripture. This means that all things necessary for our faith and our life are either in Scripture or can be deduced from Scripture. Right. Many scriptural passages show that Christians are they're not supposed to check their brains at the door, you know, when they walk into church or anything yep. like that, but to use their God-given minds in subjection to God's Word. For example, in Isaiah 118, it says, Come, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. Right. In Romans 12, too, it says, Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Christians are to think differently. We're, we're, our, our reasoning, our thinking is to be based on truth. It starts with truth, with, with axioms. Uh, then we'll be able to know the will of God. Right. And it should be axiomatic um, uh, that, that the Bible is true, right? That Christians should just submit to that. Unfortunately, yes. that's not often the case. We see that. Uh, right. The Christian faith is a knowledge-based faith. The prophet Isaiah asks repeatedly, Do you not know? Have you not heard? 
Jesus repeatedly asks, have you not read? And tells the Sadducees that they're in error because they do not know the scriptures or the power of God. Always referring back to the authority of the word of God. Right, knowledge. It's a knowledge-based religion. Right. In addition to that, Paul, in, in his letters, constantly shows that true functional faith is always built on knowledge. And, and the cause of deficient faith is deficient knowledge. Paul repeatedly asks the question, do you not know? Have you not read? Do you not know? Again and again, in, uh, for example, in, throughout 1 Corinthians and Romans, you see some of the, the references here. Uh, it's all over the place in Paul's writings. Yeah, you know, uh, my people uh, perish because of lack of knowledge, lack of because knowledge. they knowledge. reject yep. knowledge. They, they reject God's word. Now, for more details on, uh, on this week's topic, you can actually go to creation.com slash logic. And, uh, and see an, an article there uh, on the subject matter here. And we're gonna get into some examples when we come back in just a moment. Did you know that animals have genetic switches? These are regulatory regions of DNA that control the genes. Scientists have noticed that dramatic things can happen when a genetic switch is mutated. For instance, a mutated genetic switch can dramatically alter the appearance of stickleback fish or generate a great variety of coat colors in animals. Veterinary researcher Dr. Jean Leitner has suggested that God may have created genetic switches to facilitate variation, the switches having been created with a propensity to mutate without negatively affecting other traits. Modifications to genetic switches are not examples of evolution in action, even though they are often spoken of in that manner. Indeed, these changes don't involve new information, new genes arising, and evolutionists cannot explain the existence of the genetic switches in the first place. The more we learn about the complexity of genomes, the more they point to a super intelligent master programmer. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. So if you just tuned in this week, we're talking about logic, reason, and Christianity. This topic was suggested by a viewer, actually, who, who read the article by Dr. Jonathan Sarfati and wanted us to do an episode of Creation Magazine Live about it. And, and it's important to be able to recognize poor argumentation against uh, Scripture, so here we are doing it. That's right. Uh, and there's a lot of it out there. Yeah. <laughs> so we, we've defined some terms and explained some basic concepts. We'll do a little more of that and then get into some examples. In logic, an argument is defined as a sequence of statements made up of premises that are claimed to support a conclusion. And, and scripture teaches that Christians are to argue in this sense. Now, that, that, that is not the same as being argumentative uh, or arguing just for the sake of having an argument. It's a different type of argumentation. Yeah, so it's there. meant to come to a truth, to know what truth is. Right. right? Yep. So the go-to verse um, that commands this type of argumentation is in 1 Peter 3.15, where it says, but in your hearts, set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to every, everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. Uh, the Greek word uh, translated answer in 1 Peter uh, 3.15 is apologia. This term comes from the Greek word apo, which means away from, and logos, which means logic or reason. So apologia uh, means out of logic or out of reason. It refers to a reasoned defense that would be given, for example, in a court of law. Right, yeah, Christ's half-brother Jude commanded in verse three of his epistle, he said, earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. This implies a real intellectual battle to convince people of truth. Right. Christianity is involved in a truth war. It's a battle for the mind. It's a battle for truth. Right, now arguments can be either deductive or inductive. Uh, deductive reasoning is reasoning from the general to the particular, and inductive arguments reason from a finite set of examples to a general rule. So deductive arguments are the most important, so we're going to concentrate on those first. All right. Now a valid argument, here's different terms here, a valid argument is one where the conclusion follows from the premises. However, validity doesn't depend on the truth of the premises. Mm. So let's look at some examples. One example of a valid argument with true premises is all whales have backbones, Moby Dick is a whale, therefore Moby Dick has a backbone. Right, it's logical. Here we go. Now let's contrast that with an example of a valid argument with a false premise and a false conclusion. Okay. And that would be all dogs are reptiles, all reptiles have scales, therefore all dogs have scales. So in this case here, you've got one false premise leads to a false conclusion, right? right? So uh, an example of an invalid argument with a true premise and a true, true conclusion is, the sun is larger than the earth, therefore 
polytheism contradicts the Bible. All right. <laughs> so this is, an in, this is invalid because the conclusion contains terms not contained in the premise. Right. Uh, it's important to recognize valid forms of argumentation and use them, obviously, as Christians. Uh, now, moving on, a sound argument is a valid argument with true premises. So the conclusion of a sound argument must be true. Mm -hmm. So we can look at an example. Abortion is intentional killing of a fetus. A fetus is an innocent human being. Intentional killing of innocent human beings is murder. Murder is forbidden by God. Therefore, here's the conclusion, therefore abortion is forbidden by God. Right. Now, if we look at the premises, the form of the argument is valid. Yep. Premises one and three are true by the normal de definition of words, uh, can be proven by science and scripture. For example, Genesis 25, uh, 22 and Luke 1, 41 use the same words for unborn and born children, which means that you were just as human before you were born as you were after you were born. Right. And so uh, this is uh, proven by Genesis 9, 6, Exodus 20, 13, and Romans 13, 9, uh, premise 4. So the argument is sound. Right. And uh, when we come back, we'll define yet another term, the contradiction, and we'll look at some more examples. We'll be right back. Creation Ministries International staff, many from a wide variety of scientific disciplines, have produced thousands of articles now available in a massive online database. Some of the topics covered include the feasibility of Noah's Ark and evidence for a global flood, scientific arguments that explain observations in astronomy within a young Earth time frame, recent discoveries that support dinosaurs fitting with biblical history, evidence from biology that shows that the type of change that is observed in living things has absolutely nothing to do with evolution. Got questions? Get answers at creation.com. Well, on this week's episode, we're talking about logic, reason, Christianity, and this isn't really focused specifically on creation, but right. it has to do with the truth of all of Christianity, and there are uh, often articles uh, covering topics like this, um, articles not focusing directly on the creation evolution debate on uh, creation.com and uh, in our creation magazine, of course. Yeah, part of the reason for today's topic is that uh, it, it's an increasingly important, it, it's, it's becoming increasingly important for Christians to be able to discern poor arguments against Scripture, and there's a lot of them out there. Uh, Creation Ministries International, CMI, focuses on showing how the latest scientific discoveries support Genesis. That's our focus, but we certainly believe that the whole Bible is infallible. It's actually the Word of God where He describes to us who He is so that we can serve Him effectively. So it's important to defend all of Scripture. Right, so, so let's talk about uh, a contradiction. Contradiction, what, okay. would be a what contradiction? is a contradiction? Okay. A contradiction consists of a logical incompatibility between two or more propositions. Okay. For any pair of uh, contradictory premises, one must be true and the other false. The law of non-contradiction prevents both premises being true, while the law of excluded middle points out that a pair of contradictory premises exhausts all possibilities. So uh, another way of putting it is a proposition must be either true or false, not both true and false, nor in, in, in some limbo state in between true and falsity. Right. This can be useful in, in, in listing all possible or alternatives and refuting all of them, uh, but, but the correct one. All right, yeah, C.S. Lewis's famous trilemma argument is a good example of exactly this. It goes like this. Jesus Christ is reported to have claimed to be God. The reports are either true or false. If the reports are false, the reporters either knew they were false or they did not. So 1A, you can follow this through here. If they knew they were false, they were liars. But who would die for what they know is a lie? That just doesn't right. make sense. Most of Jesus' disciples were martyred for believing that Jesus really was God. Pretty horribly. Uh, yes. Yeah. 1B. If they did not know, then it's a big problem to explain how legends could accumulate so quickly around a historical figure in, in, in such a short time. Um, if the reports are true, then Jesus was either speaking falsely or truly. If Jesus spoke falsely, either he knew it was uh, or he did not. If he knew, then he was a liar. If he didn't know, then he was a lunatic since he claimed to be God, <laughs> yeah. the most absurd claim anyone can make. If Jesus spoke truly, then he really is God. Right. So famous, uh, famous argument from yes. C.S. Lewis. Yep. Now, in, in that example, um, you can see how falsehoods can be weeded out through the use of logic. 
it's, it's a very useful tool. Anti-Christians right. often charge the, the Bible with contradicting itself because they realize that if the charge were proven, it would disprove divine authorship. But most of the skeptics, of course, are ignorant of the definition of a, of a contradiction anyway. <laughs> right, yeah. Uh, for example, Bible skeptics will claim a contradiction regarding the, 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 the number of blind men healed. Matthew, Matthew 20, 29 states that Christ healed two blind men. That doesn't contradict Mark 10, 6. They say it does, but it doesn't, which states that Bartimaeus was healed. Why? Because it doesn't say that only Bartimaeus was healed. Right. So it's not a contradiction. Right. Uh, and here's something to be on the lookout for. Many statements by anti-Christians might appear reasonable on the surface, but actually refute themselves. An important aspect of a contradiction is self-refutation. Right. Some common examples are, uh, are these. There is no truth. <laughs> well, that would mean that the sentence itself isn't true, so it's self-refuting, right? Right. Uh, we can never know anything for certain. So... How would we know that is for certain? Same problem. Right? <laughs> exactly. A statement's only meaningful if it's either necessarily uh, truth of logic or can be tested empirically. Well, that statement itself it can't be uh, is neither a necess necessary truth or logic, and it can't be tested empirically, so it's meaningless by its own criteria. Right. Right. Here, here's another one. <laughs> there are no moral absolutes, so we ought to be tolerant of other people's morals. But ought implies a moral absolute, that <laughs> toleration right. Something is good. Something you ought to do. Uh, right. Yeah. That, that's contradictory. So the, the statement refutes itself. Now, we'll continue with, with more examples uh, when we get back, and we'll look at this in a little bit, a little bit more detail. Drop stones are rocks that have been carried and dropped into finely grained sediment. For instance, icebergs can carry and drop rocks on the ocean floor to be covered by further sedimentation. Noah's flood was a worldwide catastrophe that deposited much of Earth's fossil-bearing rocks. However, within these rocks, we find what appear to be drop stones. This is often interpreted as evidence of previous ice ages. And since you can't have ice ages occurring during the flood, this has prompted some to claim that drop stones disprove Noah's flood. However, drop stones can be formed by mechanisms that don't involve icebergs. For example, floating tree stumps can have rocks entangled within them, which are then dropped on the ocean floor. Moreover, recent research in the journal Marine Geology has shown that a large seaweed known as kelp has a surprising ability to carry and drop sizable rocks, so drop stones don't disprove Noah's flood. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. This week we're talking about, we're looking at various forms of arguments. Uh, as Christians, we need to be able to spot faulty argumentation in our own thinking and in the attacks that come from skeptics as well. Right, so thing to do. we can have clear thinking and we can detect when somebody does yes, this, right? Yes, exactly. Yep. So here's a final question. Why should logic work at all, right? Not only, not only yep. can unbelievers not make a sound case against Christianity, but an atheistic worldview attacks the very basis of reasoning itself. They always want to be reasonable and logical. And, that's you know, what and you attack. hear that's all right. the time. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. this was realized by the famous communist evolutionary biologist J.B.S. Haldane when he said this, If my mental processes are determined wholly by the motions of atoms in my brain, I have no reason to suppose my beliefs are true. And hence, I have no reason for supposing my brain to be composed of atoms. Again, it's kind of self-refuting, isn't that, it? That's amazing. Uh, yeah. Why say anything at all? Exactly. <laughs> anyway, yeah. whole, everything becomes meaningless. Yeah. But in, in, in a debate between uh, a Christian William Lane Craig and atheist Frank Zindler, Zindler claimed that our logical processes evolve for survival value. And then Craig, who's, who's a great debater in, in many cases, Craig pointed out that this provides no reason for us to trust their validity, only their value in survival. That's see, right. Craig was able to, to, to see the flaw in Zindler's argumentation. Exactly. So that's what you can do if you learn this, this logic stuff. Yep. <laughs> so Isaac Newton, he's still hailed as the, the greatest scientist who ever lived. And, and he was a young earth creationist, by the way. Yes. Yep. Recognized the anti-intellectual nature of atheism that dominates so much of uh, academia today uh, when he said this, opposition to godliness is atheism in profession and idolatry in practice. 
Atheism is so senseless and odious to mankind that it never had many professors. I love the word odious. It just sounds so <laughs> British somehow. Yeah, so, uh, <laughs> yeah wonderful. Um, Charles Darwin wrote in an early private notebook, he said this, why is thought being a secretion of the brain more wonderful than gravity as a property of matter? But this argument is self-defeating because it applies uh, to that thought of Darwin's too. Right, that and, very and, thought. And to every thought about evolution. Hence, we have no reason to trust them by, by his own statement. Yeah, and the, and the famous Marxist uh, paleontologist Stephen Jay Gould claimed that the mind was an illusion produced by the brain. Okay. Well, why should we trust anything Gould ever said then if his thoughts are illusions? Exactly. I, isn't the very fact that somebody even said that an illusion? It's, it's just you can, hopefully you can pick out the breakdown in, in these, these statements that we're putting up here. You can see where the, the flaws in these arguments. Right. And this only shows that many atheistic theories actually refute themselves. Now, on the other hand, the Christian doctrine that we are created in the image of a logical God is an excellent explanation for our logical faculties, right. the, the things that we, we have. There's, there's a great video by Dr. Jonathan Sarfati. It's actually like a course on logic and spotting bad arguments. Just brilliant, a brilliant video. Yep. It's called Leaving Your Brains at the Church Door. <laughs> and, and you can get, if you're, you're a viewer of, of Creation Magazine Live, you can get the DVD or, or digital download, your, your, whichever one, at 50% off. Right. What you want to do is use the coupon code. Uh, let's see here. Uh, CML. LBDC, Creation Magazine Live, leaving your brains at the church door. And you use that when you check out at creation.com. It's a, it's a great video. I think it's, it's one of those, it, it's almost a must-watch video for, for like junior hires and high schoolers, Christians, in your youth group and at, right. at, at church, that kind of thing. Yeah, I really got them start thinking about logic and, and, and you know, how to pick out things. Because right. we live in a society today which is absolutely overloaded with information. Oh yeah. Nobody yeah. has a, yep. a has a has a problem with lack of information. I mean, we're just no. inundated no. with it. So what people need is actually filters and ways to determine what is useful, good logic. Yeah, that it, would be the the, it, the word, it's isn't discernment. it? Discernment. Just what people discern need. <laughs> what is correct, what is incorrect, and so training the mind in discernment is of the utmost importance. Yes. Because, yeah. you know, uh, I, I love what. Uh, uh, Joe Boot. He's a, a, a pastor here in Canada and, and uh, debater, debates atheists all the time. Yeah, good and guy. Just a, just a, a brilliant guy. And, and in, his, in his debates with atheists, uh, one, of the, one of the things he'll say often is things like this. Well, I want to thank my opponent for showing up here today. Yes. Because in doing so, he's proven <laughs> my worldview right. Well, what's he talking about? Well, the fact is, he's a Christian. He's debating them on the existence of God, whether God exists or not. Right. And in a debate situation, what two people have done is set themselves up. One is saying, I'm right. The other is saying, no, I'm right. But the only way to have an actual right or wrong, an absolute right or wrong, is if there's an absolute moral lawmaker that you can then determine what right and wrong is based on. Yes. And so yeah. what he's saying there is he's showing their illog illogicality of saying, you're wrong because then God would have to exist for them to be wrong. Right. And we'll be back in just a moment. Richard Van Grad and Kelvin Smith also host a fast-paced and informal internet-based video program called Genesis Unleashed. These faith-building teaching videos feature responses to news articles, summaries of articles on creation.com, interviews, and answers to some of the most asked questions about the creation evolution issue and the most attacked book of the Bible, Genesis. Visit creation.com's media center to view or subscribe to the latest video content. Welcome back. This is the In the News section. There's always something about the creation evolution debate in the news, so let's dig into this. Yep. Here's a uh, recent news article. Breathtaking fossil of tiny mammal preserves fur and internal organs. Here we go with some of the highlights from the article. <laughs> the exquisitely preserved fossil of a tiny mammal from the time of the dinosaurs reveals a variety of soft tissues, including skin, fur, and spines. Even remnants, even remnants of the, its external ear were fossilized. The find pushes back the earliest record of mammal, mammalian internal organs and well-preserved fur by more than 60 million years. Continuing, finding complete fossils like this raises the bar for the rest of us, says Richard uh, Cifelli, a vertebrate paleontologist of the University of Oklahoma in Norman, who was not involved with the, the new study. 
my breath is taken away. That's amazing. So quite a fossil find. People are excited about it. Yep. Uh, the article says that it's 125 million years old, or it's found in 125 million year old, year old rock in Spain. Uh, the creature likely measured about 24 centimeters. We can put a picture of it up here, uh, 9.4 inches or so in length and weighed between 50 and 70 grams, about the size and proportions of a, of a juvenile rat. That's, that's the way it was described there. So right. uh, it, was it was found in finely layered limestones that entombed the fossil and uh, it was deposited in a freshwater wetland. Okay, freshwater wetland. Okay. And then, then the article says, rapid burial of the ancient carcass in sediment as well as low concentrations of oxygen in the ancient marsh likely contributed to its exceptional preservation. Right. So, uh, okay, so it's a, it's a watery type of rapid burial. Yep. <laughs> Boy, it's ringing a bell. The, uh, the, these things are always delivered to us with, with this nice little evolutionary packaging, right? You read news articles like this on some new fossil find or whatever, and it's, um, you know, it, it's always, here you go, and here's how it fits with this evolutionary with evolution. box. Yeah. Right? Well, so they call this a fossil, but so well preserved is this animal, yeah. we read the fossil, or the following. <laughs> they said the fossil also includes internal organs. Within the rib cage, there are patches of soft tissue that contain tubular structures in a branching pattern, which the team interprets as preserved lung tissue. Uh, farther down the abdomen is a large oval region of reddish brown material, like the remnants of the creature's liver. They've even found pigment preserved in here. Yeah, so this the, isn't just the, well preserved. We've got soft tissues here. Now, of course. 125 million years old. Right. right. But they have found soft tissues in dinosaur era or way older uh, creatures now, over 30 times. And you can see this on our website, go yeah. to creation.com, put in soft tissues, and, and you're gonna get article after article after article referencing secular uh, articles yes. like this yeah. one. They, they make the discoveries. They make so, the discoveries, yeah. we're reporting on it, and yet somehow we're supposed to believe that these soft tissues could be preserved for 70, 125 million years? Yeah, yeah, I mean, and, and they say here, rapid burial and, and low concentrations of oxygen likely in a marsh. It, you, could, you, could, you could put that thing in a glass of formaldehyde, it's not gonna last 125 million years. <laughs> soft just, tissues aren't gonna last. Simply depriving it of oxygen is not going to preserve it for 125 million years. Right, well, aren't you also assuming that the environment it stayed in was, it was exactly the same for 125, 125 million, million years? years? Yeah, right. Where yeah. they're always telling us that there was, you know, over millions of years, there's all these environmental changes, and, and of course things were evolving, and sure. the landscape was shifting, yeah. and, and the dinosaurs building. went extinct during that time somewhere. And, uh, yeah, and so it, how did it suppose, you know, again, how did did it stay the same when everything was changing? The, the Bible the just makes so much more sense. There was a big and, flood. Uh, yeah, there's a big flood that buried things recently. But that's what yeah. this show is all about. That's what CMI is all about. Next week on the show, the probability of evolution. We'll see you next week.